Welcome everybody to the podcast uh, here at Victor Outdoors. Um, hey, we're just uh, catching up with a good friend, um, Tom here from Rack Fuel. And uh, Tom, you know, we kind of wanted to get you on, um, obviously, uh, aside from uh, owning Rack Fuel and, and having a, a big part in that company, um, we kind of wanted to reach out and kind of talk to you a little bit about uh, early season hunting uh, and those kinds of things. So that's kind of, you know, going to be our uh, topic of the day. We're going to talk about, you know, what kind of things you look for uh, early on in the season. And we'll, we'll dip into uh, some food plot and maybe some strategy around food plots in, in early season too. Um, but, you know, uh, for the folks that, um, you know, don't know you uh, kind of intro into kind of you and in your company. Thanks for having us on, uh, Curtis. So we started Rack Fuel a, a few years ago. Um, we sell a lot of food plot seeds. We've got a, a number of different blends from anything from, you know, early season through through late season. But we also have our feed and, and mineral. So a, a lot of people know me from initially it's from the attractants and, and the mineral from years ago. That's how you and I... Um, met you know right. over 10 years ago so um right we're based out of uh eau claire wisconsin um but we do a lot of stuff in iowa and around you guys um the jacklins part of wicked whitetail outdoors are our our yeah. partners in, in rack fuel with us um so we do a lot of stuff down there around either outfitting business testing stuff um so yeah. That's kind of how everything got started. We've, we've all, those guys have used the product for years. Um, our, the other two partners have used it for years and, uh, they just wanted us to, to try and, and get it going. Um, so. You know, one thing I'll say, and, and I don't know who came up with the, the names and that kind of stuff, but you know, even your previous company that you, that you had that, you, that we met through, and even this company, one of the things that I've always, you know, liked is like, man, you guys hit it out of the park when you decide to name a, a, a brand, right? right? We, <laughs> we, it's uh, it's crazy because I've had um, some other guys after they've seen, um, you know, what we've done, whether it was the old company with Monster Racks um, or, or this one with Rack Fuel. And they're like, can you come up with a logo? Can you come up with a name? Um, and I haven't really figured out anything for, for anyone else. Um, I don't do anything even remotely close to this, you know, for, for work. Um, but I know right. what, what I, what I like. Um, and, and I know what we're trying to kind of show people. So, you know, we have a graphic designer that, that puts everything together, but, um, every package that we have all of our products um i send list by list all the way down i i basically have designed you know everything that we've that we have um so yeah, yeah and i mean in one of the cool things about um rack fuel that kind of drew us in um was the fact that you know as you know, because you guys do plenty of hunting in Iowa as well, you know, we're we're a little bit limited on the attractant and, and the feed side of things, especially. I mean, we can certainly do that outside right. the season. But when you get close to the season, um, you know, you got to start. You know, you, you basically can't have that right. stuff out. And, and if you do use attractants, you have to do it in a in a fashion that you can be sure that you're going to you know, pass the red face test, if you want to call it that, you know, if, if anybody ever questions, you know, where your mineral locations are and that kind of stuff. And, and so one of the things that we've always done, uh, and I mean, this goes back years, um, for me is I've always, you know, strategically placed those. And it's like, um, knowing, you know, kind of, you know, how you're going to work around those things in the future. But, um, you know, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, we more, more often than using those, like, well, I love that stuff, especially late season, being able to feed, um, you know, we, we use, uh, 
you know, boss buck feeders and, and we're able to supplement, especially in those winter months. Um, and that's, that's huge for, uh, you know, Southern Iowa, it's a big deal, but not even, you know, you get into Northern Iowa and obviously back when, uh, 10 years ago, I lived in Northeast Iowa. I lived a lot closer to you guys okay. than, than I do now. And, uh, I lived up there in the Northeast corner, um, you know, right, you know, Clayton County, uh, Howard County, um, right up there, uh, in Northeast Iowa. And now I'm down in Madison County, um, Southwest of, uh, of Iowa. And so our winters are milder in Southern Iowa than what we see, you know, in Northern Iowa, but still the bottom line is, and, and this is the thing that I think that some people, you know, they, they think that we only use feed, uh, and mineral, you know, in the summer months to put deer in front of our cameras. And, and while we do that, um, it's a great, it's a great tool for us to get inventory, just the overall health of the deer herd in, um, winter, you know, and, and this is not, I'm not, you know, laying out any earth shattering details here, but, uh, most people that understand, you know, having a healthy deer herd understand that bucks, when they come in to spring, the available energy they have stored in their body um, directly relates to the uh, to their you know limitations right. in some ways because they you know obviously as stuff starts to green up and stuff starts to grow, they start you know getting you know a lot more food, a lot different, more diverse food and that kind of stuff. Intake wise, there's a lot more food available than before we get green you know leaf out. Um, but you know, that that's probably our biggest thing when it comes to utilizing that, but I want to kind of transition quickly into, into food okay. plots and actually hunting. Cause we're in early October, we're getting right there right. mid October now. Um, and, and we get a lot of talk about, you know, people talk about the October law right. <laughs> and, and whether or not you believe in that or not, um, uh, there are, I mean, I don't know how many 200 inch deer got killed in Iowa, um, with that cold front, oh. but I know of at least a, I know of at least a right. handful, um, that were killed, uh, you know, here about a week ago, two weeks ago, right. You know, that first big cold front came through and I mean, I was sitting there looking at it going, deer are going right. to die. <laughs> I mean, it's just, right. just going to happen. So talk about a little bit, your strategies, uh, and what kinds, you know, early season, where do you like to hunt first? And then what, and then how does that work with your food plot strategy and how you look to plan around that? So for, for early season, um, you know, it, it, I'm looking at, at food. Um, and I, if I'm hunting in the woods on small little kill plots, you know, quarter acre or, or less, um, uh, we've got a couple blends that, that I really like that, that I, I hunt uh quite a bit it's uh you know and i don't like to do just one thing i i like to mix it up so even if it's a quarter acre i'll do half of it in let's say showtime um that's our you know drought and shade tolerant blend and and also uh rack magnet on the other half and they're both um okay shade and drought tolerant just showtime is is just more because you're not going to get a lot of sun you know in in those small little kill plots in the woods so i want it to be as green and lush as i can and and be able to take the the browse pressure so you know if i can get that close to to where there's you know an, a, an acorn flat um that's about as good as it gets you know if we can if we if i can get a little pond in there um we, we like to do that. I like to have water, you know, by my food plots. The one thing that we've used quite a bit um, this year is it's Earth Blinds is is the company. Um, I, don't, I don't mess with their blinds. I haven't tried them, but they've got these these ponds that uh, hold anywhere from like 50 to, to 150 gallons. And so far they've worked really well for us. So if I can get food, you know, especially with acorns, I'm not sure how it's it's been down there for you guys, but you know, up here in Minnesota and Wisconsin, I have never seen so many acorns. It's it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. we're loaded. Um, it, I mean, I, on the 
on our two main farms that Dennis and I hunt anyway, um, those two farms, I mean, it was almost like, you know, walking on ice. There was just so much underneath your feet. I mean, um, and, and we were hanging stands. I was, I think it was, we hung some stands. I think it was late September. I don't think it was October yet. Um, but yeah, it was just covered. And then we've obviously gone in there, but I mean, yeah, it was loaded with loaded with deer. I mean, um, so yeah, you know, and that, I think you bring up a really good point. Um, you know, from the standpoint of you're not just looking at the food that you planted out there. You want to make sure that you put that next to their natural right. food sources. Right. right. Absolutely. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, there's no one, you know, magic bullet, to, you know, or, 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 the, you know, what we, we try to make. If there was well, Tom, um, we all would have killed for sure. Inch deer. So, you know, um, <laughs> we try different things and I don't just hunt over, you know, our food plots. We do a lot of stuff with bean and corns as well. Now we do have our own forage yeah. beans. Um, so, so, you know, we do a lot of that, but the biggest thing is, is I like to make the food as diverse as I can, whether it's, it's their natural browse, whether it's acorns. Um, but if we're doing food plots, it's, it's multiple things, you know, um, I do a lot of stuff with, with Zach Haas, uh, from Creek bottom land management. Him and I do a, a lot of the conversations when we're coming up with, with our food plots. Um, and, mm-hmm. and then, you know, a couple of agronomists and, and, you know, a number of different land managers that, that kill really big deer. But, uh, I, I talk with Zach quite a bit and, and the whole focus really is, is that whole, you know, food plot architecture and, and trying to get deer to go to specific spots where you want them. And if you can funnel them and work them in front of your stands and increase your chance of success, that's, that's about as good as it gets. Yeah, for sure. And, and you, uh, you know, one thing that, uh, that we're doing on a couple of our newer farms this year, because we didn't have any experience with them is, you know, we were like, okay, we, we, think we know how these deer right. move so it was a little bit of a uh you know, a little bit of a crapshoot i guess when we were looking at how we wanted and we already had established food plots but what we wanted to do is how do you plant them and and what goes right. where and and you know how much of a screen do i need in those locations and what's you know what's you know too much um because it, it I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, now we're sitting there and we're out there hunting and it's like, you know what, next year we're going to do this and we're going to do this. And it's like, all of a sudden, like we have this, we start to have this understanding, oh, this is how they work. This is what they're doing. Um, You know, so we've, Dennis and I haven't done a lot of serious hunting yet, um, other than we've been doing a lot of observation sits. So we've been sitting in blinds, watching our food plots, watching how the deer are entering the food plots coming and going that kind of stuff um and and we've we've hunted a little bit in in the timber as well to get that you know aspect of it too to kind of see where they're going and where they're coming from and bedding areas versus you know just um you know what where our rut stands are going to be where we're going to plan on intercepting deer you know any time of the day type of thing um but one of the you know you mentioned it um showtime and and the fact that it's a drought resistant uh blend and obviously uh you you guys had it just as bad as we did um here in iowa i think um you know we uh, in my day job i deal with um the the different stages so if, if you guys are unfamiliar with the the u.s drought monitor um it does have you know it's got a lot of stuff a lot of data that goes into it to come up where you know, identifying where the drought is and isn't, um, or how bad a drought is in certain locations and stuff. And, and so it's not a, you know, it's, it's not the end all be all, cause obviously it's based off of, you know, different kinds of data, data sets, but it gives you a very good idea of what kind of, um, uh, you know, moisture or lack of moisture you're getting in certain areas. And so I know Wisconsin, 
um, especially southern Wisconsin, had it really bad. Uh, basically, the vast majority of all of Iowa had um, some form right. of drought. Now, down down in the neck of the woods where you guys uh, do your hunting um, in that you know in that area in you know southwest Iowa, they actually fared pretty well. They did get some timely rains and that kind of stuff, and and we did as well here in Madison. Um, we were one of the few counties that did not did didn't ever get into the D two drought uh category we we kind of stayed around that d0 or d1 level um but we had d2 and d3 and d4 even uh by the time the summer was up so um you know there was you know parts of iowa that were a lot worse off than us but at at any rate we planted in in one of our kill plots um actually two of our kill plots but one in particular that um it's kind of on a river bottom uh and we've got um it's it's basically an open area that's surrounded by large uh one one's an oak tree and then it's a couple of uh there's a cottonwood in there a um, couple of big cottonwoods in there and then um just some other like basswood and that kind of stuff but we 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 have kind of there's a uh somewhat open canopy over that hole in the middle so it gets some right. sunlight but it doesn't get your sunlight that you expect in a food plot that's more on a field edge or on the right. edge of a timber type of thing and um the fact that it's on a river bottom those soils there it has really um uh uh kind of um uh it has very organic okay. soil there so it does hold moisture fairly right. well. Um, and, and in those river bottoms, you get some, you know, some dew and that kind of stuff. But I will say that showtime is the most beautiful carpet of green uh, right now, you know, and, and the deer in it every right. single night. And they're in the, in the mornings all night long type of thing. Um, and so it's one of those, um, you know, it's, it's, I've done a lot. I've done kill plots right. forever. Right. So it, it isn't, it isn't my first rodeo with that. And I've used lots of different kinds of seed mixes and showtime. One of the cool things about it is, is that it has just some really, uh, it's it, uh, a lot of times what people think of when they come, when they think about a kill plot is they think about like annual rye right. grass because a lot of companies will load up, uh, a throw and grow, quote unquote, throw right. and grow um, seed that will be loaded with annual ryegrass. And your guys' your guys' product does not have that, and it definitely shows because a lot of times I would plant those like ten or fifteen years ago. I can remember planting those uh, some some different kinds of um, you know kill plot type mixes, and that's all I right. would get is is just the annual ryegrass that's the only right. thing that would grow and maybe you'd get a few little little broad leaves that might pop up and that kind of stuff but for the most part it was pretty underwhelming and i will say this showtime it looks amazing it looks every bit as good as our plots that we have that have right. full sun so we have you know we have some plots that have full sun now some of those plots have some radishes and for whatever reason um we have outstanding crops of radishes uh in the, the the particular plot seed mixes that had radishes have an absolutely outstanding and i and i have a feeling that it was we planted we had a bunch of rain and then we planted right after the rain because we couldn't get in okay. before the rain we planted right after the rain um and we we drilled it so it seems like then it got dry and we got a couple of timely rains and it came up and it looked nice and green. Um, they, they look and they, and they all look amazing, but where we should see some other things, it's like the radishes just thrived so much to the point where they started drowning out stuff. Cause they have such right. huge, you know, tops on them. And, um, but man, dude, they do. I mean, they are absolutely hammering them right now. Like, I mean, a lot of people think, you know, they, you hear the term winter right. bulbs, you know, um, and, you know, people plant them thinking that you're only going to hunt them late season. But um, I took my wife out 
um, on one of those plots Saturday afternoon. We sat Saturday. We sat until dark um, Saturday evening, and um, the deer started piling in about four, and they absolutely uh, were hammering. It's funny because they weren't concentrating on the tops. They were literally ripping the tops. Like they were breaking them off in the ground, and then they were eating the radishes. Uh, so you could see them like the tops are like in their mouths, like bouncing around and they're right. chewing on that radish, trying to eat that, the actual, you know, tuber of the radish. So that was really cool to, to watch them because a lot of times that's why people call them winter bulbs because you need that freeze to make that top a little more palatable. So they were just skipping right over that. They were just eating right. the radish itself. I thought that yeah, was they, cool. they definitely, um, will eat that, you know, all the entire hunting season, um, and it definitely seems more than than whether it's a sugar beet or or a turnip. Um, they like the radishes more. Yeah, and we use radishes in in a lot of our blends. Um, that's one of my favorite things to to add in uh, for you know for me. I, I know it probably sounds crazy, but my wife, I like snap. She's like, "What are they eating?" So like, we were I had to change a battery in. The, we got a trail. Uh, we got one of our reveals sitting like directly in the middle of the food plot. Then we have one that's on the blind that we were in so we can tell how close they're walking to the blind. And then we can kind of see the other side of the plot because it's a pretty good sized plot. And so what we ended up doing was um, I walked out there and so I snapped one off. I pulled one out of the ground and I'm like, uh, and she's like, seriously, that's what that is out there. That's just a giant radish. And I'm like, yeah. And she's like, so they so they're just eating that and i'm like yeah and so she's like so is that like the same kind of radish that we eat i'm like well not exactly but i'm like you could eat it, it tastes like it tastes like a radish so i snapped it off a bit into it and she's like gross <laughs> and i'm like and and i'm like it literally tastes just right. like a radish i mean it's not i mean you know so i mean um uh but yeah they absolutely are hammering them and they and and so that's exciting because we've got Man, there is a, I was hoping I was going to see this deer, but I filmed a deer, um, in that plot. So a buck came in, he's about, he's upper one okay. forties. He's a mainframe 10. He's got a triple brow tine on one side and he's got a two and a half inch kicker on his opposite G2. Um, and so we just kind of refer to him as kicker buck. He's, uh, he's three okay. or four, so he's not really what we would consider a super, you know, right. mature deer. It's like. I mean, I suppose if he'd have walked right in front of the blind and given her a 20 yard shot, I, I, I might've let right. her shoot it. Um, cause she's only killed one buck with her bow. So, I mean, it's one of those things where I'm not sure I could have held her off from shooting it, but you might've gotten in trouble if you did from my, my, me and Dennis. Yeah. Me and Dennis's perspective. It's like, man, that's a deer that could be an absolute giant, but at any rate, I filmed him for the better part of an hour eating the radishes in there and and it was it was pretty fun like i was you know like i told you I, he had it bouncing in his mouth he's chewing on it it's like i got it zoomed in on him and everything and i'm like he's not a monster but um he's a good looking deer uh and and uh it was pretty fun just to see the deer and there is a the deer i wanted to see in there and he's he's one of those deer that likes to hang out yeah. at 2 a.m in the food plot um but he is a five-year-old uh mainframe eight that has a split g2 and we think he's going to clear 160. Really? so he's really impressive like dennis is ready to shoot him and i'm like <laughs> we've got to search bigger deer <laughs> so like not not necessarily on that particular farm but there are bigger deer on um a couple of our other farms uh and so thankfully one of our um We've got a mainframe uh, on the main farm that Dennis and I have hunted for like the last five years. We've got a uh, a mainframe um, twelve pointer, so he's a, he's a six by six. We have sheds from two years, and we have trail camera pictures of him from the last two years, and um, he is all of really? one eighty um, this year. He's only, he, he, he lost his five on one side. So he's only an 11 pointer now. Um, uh, he lost his five, uh, on the one side, but, um, he is super tall, got good mass. Um, he's, 
Um, if you guys pay attention to my social media, I posted a, a deer next to um, one of our Fission e-bikes um, a couple days ago. And that deer is a mid 170s deer. And he's um, taller and wider than that one. So, um, and it probably has better mass than that one. So, and he has right. more tines because that one only had, uh, I think that one only had, I think that one was nine pointer actually. Yeah. I remember so, seeing that, that I remember right. picture. I mean, flipping through, you know, how do you not just stop yeah. and take a look when you see a, you know, a big buck like that? I mean, that's why we all do this. You know, you see a big buck and it's like, well, yeah. you know, I, I know that's my reaction when I, even when I'm flipping through trail camera pictures, I, I just, you oh, know, yeah. as fast as I can zip through them, but you know, it's all something. It's like, well, what, you know, what did I just see? And you got to, you know, quick go back. Um, I mean, that's really what we're, I love we're doing this. I know. I love that one. It's like, it's like when we, you know, guys that have been doing it for a while, you know, when you see, you don't need to, you don't need to sit there and get a guesstimate on whether or not, oh, uh, is this going to be a deer that I really want to hunt and that kind of stuff. Usually when you see them and that, and that's one of those no doubters, you know, like that deer right there, like we were flipping through it and we got a, we got a, uh, Dennis is calling me right now. <laughs> um, we got a, uh, um, which means we probably got some trail cam photo that he saw. Cause usually I, something pops up in our, our feed, uh, in our, in our reveal feed. And he's got to call me and tell me about it. Um, so I don't even need to look at mine. And I just wait until Dennis sees a good one. And then he calls me and tells nice. me. <laughs> That's not true. I'm just like everybody else. Every morning right. I check. <laughs> so, right. um, but uh, uh, yeah, um, one thing that, uh, um, you know, those no doubters. So like, I remember looking through it. And so we got our first pictures of him uh, this year um we're on a mineral site and he was there it was middle of the night right and so i don't like i can't i feel like infrared pictures that are taken at night you can't get a good uh estimate on mass i think that you always underestimate mass when you look at nighttime photos with with infrared because for whatever reason they just don't um unless they're like super up close or something, I just can't, I can't seem to be able to get a good gauge on, you know, what they really look like. Cause I've, I've literally shot deer that I didn't think had as much mass based on nighttime photos. And then you shoot them and you're like, well, goodness, this thing's, you know, loaded right. with mass. He's, he's great. Right. You know, he, there's, you know, he, that was my question mark on that deer. You know, what does, is he going to have enough mass to really, you know, to really, crank up that score and then you shoot him and you're like well he's way better than i thought he was but it was because i was looking at nighttime photos so we got those nighttime photos and that was my first thought was dennis and i, I remember talking about it we're like i wonder how good his mass right. is because he's definitely got the height and he's got the width and if this thing has mass he's gonna break that 180 mark and so then literally like two days later he shows up and of course it's hunting season so now he shows up like two days later um, hitting a scrape and he is, you know, at four o'clock in the okay. afternoon and I'm like, well, that's awesome. Right. Cause here he is in the middle of the day, perfect broad daylight, but he was there for a good 15 minutes. He hit a scrape. He went over, hit another scrape that was within distance. Then he came back. Um, and I don't know if there were, there was other deer in the area. There was, cause there were some does that walked through and that kind of stuff. So I'm not really sure what he was doing, but he was in front of the camera from about, um, I think it was about four forty-five until about five Oh six or something like that. So it was like, um, and then actually, uh, they were moving cattle on the farm and, uh, like the last video clip of him is him and a doe basically getting spooked off. Um, because they brought in a cattle herd into that pasture. That's, I mean, they were probably, they were probably 200 yards away from him. So it wasn't like they would have scared him out of the County and they're used to, and on that farm, they're running side by side, checking cattle right. all day, every day. So it's not, it's nothing for them to run off and then, you know, get to safety and then hang out and then we'll see him again. But, um, yeah, we're Dennis and I are going to, if he's going to keep showing up in the daytime, we're going to have to focus right. on, in on him again. <laughs> uh, before the rut gets here. So, but let's, yeah. So like, what do you like strategy wise, early season, do you, 
do you pay any attention to like hunting over scrapes or or anything like that or are you just more looking uh bed to food and that kind of you thing? know a lot of it's it's bed to food but but even you know like i said before where you're looking i'm looking for water and, and acorns and and food um you know a lot of times yeah. uh, you know on those edges you, you've got scrapes in those in those food plots um we do a lot of mock scrapes uh, you know some some hemp ropes some vines but uh but a lot of you know just natural um mock scrapes just to get it started because once they start to to get used to that um you know it's it just one more thing to to give you an advantage and the one thing for sure that i do um every time on a scrape i i, I pee in every 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 one um i mean yeah. it's i i know years ago you, you know you're, you're supposed to pee in a, a gatorade bottle or, or or something and make sure you don't get anything in anywhere um right and then a buddy of mine mentioned that that he peed in his scrapes and and he's like he wouldn't believe the deer the big bucks that come in and uh and i'm like well i'm gonna try it and see and that that's probably at least 10 years ago and i've been doing it ever since and and i mean some just giants on camera afterwards you know once that uh, ammonia breaks down I, I i don't I mean realistically do they know that it was a human or or they they just get that that ammonia smell that but they know someone it wasn't yeah. them they know it's not their their scent right so um so yeah i i i 100 percent agree with it so and and this is so a lot of people that worry about leaving behind human odor or scent you have to understand where human odor comes from and it comes from bacteria well unless you have a bladder infection or a kidney right. infection your urine should be um uh basically bacteria free like um so yeah you're absolutely right like basically you know it's it's basically uh urea and and water essentially right um there is some ammonia that will burn off and that kind of stuff but bottom line is um i don't think that in and, and to be honest like i'll pee out of oh, my for sure stand. i don't care yeah um and 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 a matter of fact like uh i've got a good buck that showed up a couple days ago on that kill plot and i was hunting that same kill plot last year um i believe it was november i believe it was november 4th or november 2nd i don't remember which but i was hunting um that same kill plot and i had a beautiful uh four-year-old come in and he's got some extra junk on the one side and that kind of stuff but he's a really nice mainframe 10 with some extra stuff and kickers and stuff um, and that kind of runs in that particular, on that farm, there's a genetic out there that, that we see three or four deer that on one side or another, they have like these extra points at the end of their main beam. So they'll have like an extra time, but it, instead of it coming up on, setting up on top of the, the beam, it comes out okay. from the middle. And, and so it kind of comes out and it, and it points out towards the beam. So almost like it runs along next to the beam type of thing. Um, but we have that genetic, it, it just seems to be all over the place and stuff. And, um, that actually what we ended up having was, uh, I, I, I saw that deer it was the first, it was really, I, I was actually trying to kill a doe out of that. I was, my whole plan is I was going to be hunting by myself. I had a camera arm I had, so I had my big camera, but I was more, I was more looking forward to, I had a Tacticam wide angle 5.0 plus then I had the Tacticam 6.0 off my bow. And so my goal was if I got a doe into that kill plot is I wanted to kill the, uh, kill a doe and, and really I wasn't concerned with using the big camera necessarily. I wanted to basically film it 100% with like a tactic cam. So that was kind of my original idea on it. And what I wanted to do was, um, that was my whole plan. Well, then here comes this buck and it's like, okay, okay, of course. Um, 
I don't have my wife with me because if my wife would have been with me again, it's a deer that I, I'm going to pass, but I would let her shoot. But yeah, that deer comes in and I probably 10 minutes before that I had peed out of my stand and he comes in and he walks down and he's going to a scrape that's on the other side of the fence. That's actually in the cow pasture. That's it's the same farm, but it's just, there's a cow pasture there and I'm in the, I'm inside the timber. And so I'm on the edge of that. So I can see there, but instead of he gets right there and then he lifts his head up and he smells something and he turns and he walks right <laughs> underneath my stand, right to where I pee. And he's just sitting there sniffing around, not really sure what's going on. He leans over and he, you know, uh, eats a, you know, a leaf of something. There's like some, you know, um, he wasn't like directly under where I peed or anything, but he's like 10 right. yards out and he's just, he could smell something that he's not sure what it is, but he does, he's not right. spooked at all. And he turns and he walks back, then he jumps the fence, he hits the scrape and then he heads out into that cow the cow pasture and I see him go up and he goes right by one of my other stands, actually the stand I killed out of, uh, later on that year. And so I ended up seeing him oh, about every time I hunted. Um, so it was no, it was no shock to me to see him in that kill plot this year, but this year he's in nice. Um, he's not, he's, he's going to break. He's probably mid one sixties. I think, um, he's not, a super monster by any means but he's he's a deer that it would be he's one of those that it's not a no doubter for me because i'd really want to break my right. personal best uh this year um but he is definitely um something that be hard like he does that same thing and i'm in the stand and i'm filming it's going to be a hard t thing to pass on uh because la the year before it's kind of funny because like ian sparks who has given me more uh, crap about <laughs> shooting, you know, deer that I should have let walk. Um, he's like, man, I can't believe you didn't shoot that deer with that kind of footage. Like he was right there and it's early and everything. And I'm like, right. he's a four year old and he's like upper one forties. Like, and he's got all this extra stuff. Like how, how could I shoot right. him? And he was like, I know I'm right. just saying, man. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, all right, well, I'm like, maybe I'm growing as a, I'm growing as a, right. a bow hunter. I'm not so willing to, to whack one that needs right. to grow, but it's hard to do. Um, you know I mean? That's oh, yeah. that, that passing that deer that, that needs another year when it's, it's already a good deer. It's yeah. You know, the, um, the first big deer I, I passed, um, is a buck, buck, you know, we, we, we called split brow this years ago. Um, he was three years old. We figured he was right in that 150, 152. And uh yeah. A, a buddy of mine I was I was showing, and he's like, if you can let him get a couple more years, he's going to be a giant. And you know, I, I went in to try to hunt a, a different deer that that day, and and sure as hell, you know, here he comes. So, I mean, right, perfect in, and I'm like, I didn't even want to look at the deer, you know, but um <laughs> I'm glad I, I, I passed them. We, we never killed that deer. Um, but I have his right antler from years ago and, and, uh, yeah. his right antler is 98 inches exactly. And it is, it is the antler that's in the A of rack fuel. Right. Um, right. Yeah. The, the logo. The logo. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's off that buck. Um, yeah. He, he really big at four. Um, I would have shot him for sure at four. Actually, I, 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 I mean, I had my spot picked out cause I mean, he was coming in to, to the beans and I'm like, and literally just two days before the season started, you know, and in Minnesota, it starts earlier than you guys, you know, it's the middle of, of September and those yeah. beans turned yellow and he, I mean, he moved, um, I mean, to the other side of the farm, um, and he was just gone at five and then at six, it just didn't matter. He, he, he had a big circle. He didn't like other deer by him. Um, when he was gone at, f at five, um, something happened. He was, so he was blind in his, his left eye 
and he didn't like cameras. He didn't like to be by other deer. And, and he was, he always had extra points and, and some junk, but nothing freaky. And then when he came back and, and that, that eye issue on his left side and then his right, you know, he had technically it's three different uh, main beams on, on that side, but as, wow. as big as that side is, I, I know it scores more than, than what is left side. We never found it. I, I mean, I brought guys in and dogs and we tried everything to find the other side. The other side was more impressive looking, um, super tall, but that was, that was it. We never, we never seen him again. Never heard, you know, of him. It just, I, I mean, my guess is died some sometime that year because you a deer like that you hear about, you know. So we figured he was. Yeah, we had a. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how did, how how big did you guys figure we, we he was? We thought man? he was pretty right right around two ten. You know, two oh eight, two oh nine, two ten, right okay. right in there. You know, and and that was before, you know yeah. just from looking at trail camera pictures. But you know, when you you look at enough yeah. and you pay attention, you can be pretty close. Um, and then when we mm-hmm. you know got that side and we had it scored at ninety eight, you know we we figured we were right in the ballpark. Yep. So. Yep. Yeah, we we've had um, obviously you know that's one thing um, like Zach. Uh, Geith on our team killed that 210 last year. Uh, the deer he called Max, and uh, um, that deer he had like three years of history with. And what what ended up happening, um, you could tell on the trail cam photos, like we knew that that deer was most likely going to at least push that uh, 200 mark. Now. You know, uh, it's not like Zach's, you know, is, you know, probably probably 10 or 15 years ago, Zach killed his first, you know, 190, uh, 190 plus deer is 191. And he's killed several 180 inch deer and, and, you know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, he's, he knows what he's doing as far as that kind of stuff goes. And he knew what kind of a special deer that was. And I remember when I got the phone call, I knew he was hunting that day. I knew he was going in after him because he was patterning weather patterns. And when that deer moved through that area, cause he, it was an extremely small piece that he was hunting that he had that deer's trail cameras on that, that deer did not live there, but he wasn't very right. far away. And he would frequent that at, especially with certain patterns, certain uh, weather patterns would come through and that kind of stuff. And he would come in and, and he, he would always have them on trail cam. So he started like keeping track of all that stuff and everything and really trying to hone in on exactly what was going to happen. And I knew he was hunting that night. I knew we had a really big cold front that had come through. Um, so it came, the, that cold front came through at about 7 a.m. that morning. And Zach hunted, and his plan was to hunt all day. But it was a, you know, November cold, cold front. So it was already cold before the cold front got right. there. So that morning, especially when it's right. morning. So then it just keeps getting colder throughout the morning. So by 11 o'clock, he's like, he's like, I was frozen. I had to get down. So he got down, went back to his house, which his house wasn't very far from there, went back to his house. Um, and he actually, uh, showered, got something to eat and headed right back out basically after about an hour and a half and was back in the stand. And because he called me in the, he called me when he was at his house. and And so I knew he was going back out. And so I get that call and I see it and I just, I was looking at my wife, I was sitting right next to her and I'm like, uh Oh, and she's like, what? And I'm like, it's Zach. And I'm like, it's not dark yet. So he probably shot something. And if he did, it's probably a monster. And, um, so he's still on the stand, he's shaking and everything like that. And like, I can hear right. his voice, you know, like, and, and I'm like, and, and he's like, and I'm like, okay. And he's like, he's dead. He's like, I smoked him. He was spraying blood and he goes, he went out into the cornfield that's adjacent to here. He goes, I haven't gone to look for him yet. He's I'm going to give him a little time before I get down, but he's like, I'm going to go before it gets light or before, excuse me, before it um, gets dark. And so sure enough, then 
Um, I was like, all right, man. So then he, he got down and he, he, as soon as he got up to the fence line, he could see him laying out there in the field and he walked up on him and fa he FaceTimed me then. And, and he's like, uh, talking to me, he's like, well, man, he's like, he's gotta be really close to that special number. Um, he goes, I, you know, he's like, I don't want to jinx it, but he goes, he's a lot bigger than my 191. Um, and he goes, the trail cam pictures, he goes, we knew he was going to be close, but he goes, it doesn't right. do him justice. And I'm like, okay. I was like, well, I'm like, I'll be there in the morning to take right. pictures. So, um, so he got him back to the house and, and, and that kind of stuff. And, and he, he, he told me, he's like, I'm not going to measure him until you get here. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So, so, uh, I'm, a, I don't know how he did it. Um, uh, because I would have had to know. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, he waited until I got there and then we measured it together and then we measured right. it again, uh, to, to make sure that, that it was, um, and we, we came within, um, I think we came within a half inch, uh, the second time we measured it. So we took the lower of the two scores because it was two ten. Right. Who cares? Right. For sure. <laughs> At that point, like not too worried about a half, a, a half of, uh, a, a half right. an inch or whatever. And I mean, obviously, um, you know, his, he was going to have Cameron, uh, Coble, uh, uh, me measure it. And I don't know if Cameron ever did measure it, um, at the deer classic, um, he did come and look at it. Well, if it's a 200 uh, incher, there's a good like, chance that Cameron did, did the measuring. He, uh, well, he, he looked at it and he goes, cause the, the photos, even the photos I took, you, you look at it and it's like, man, you still don't get a grasp for how tall the G twos are. The G twos are 16 and like 16 and like Jeez. five eights, you know? And it's just, you, it, he's so he has so much mass and and all the everything else is so much bigger you know it's just you don't everything's so symmetrical on him i mean he's not obviously not a, a, a super typical deer necessarily he, he definitely is going to be non-typical because he's got extra stuff going on but he, everything is in proportion right. and so when you look at the pictures and that kind of stuff yeah you can tell right away it's a huge deer but you what you can't tell is you know, you don't get an idea for how tall those tines are and how much mass there is because the mass is ridiculous on that deer. Um, but yeah, I mean, and so, yeah, when you talk about that, it's like, you know, that those deer are no doubters, you know, that right. it's a shooter for sure. And, and that kind of thing. But it, until you put a tape to him, like, I don't, I, I had, even when I walked, I walked up to him and I'm like, that's the biggest deer I've ever seen, you know, dead that I put my right. hands on. Um, at least, I mean, aside from like, you know, being at the deer right. classic and, you know, being able to be close to right. big deer like that. But yeah, I mean, it was, it was incredible. And, and then we measured it and, you know, I remember sitting there and he, he adds it up and he just looks at me like with, and he, he you gotta know, yeah. you, know you know, Zach, he, he looks at me like, um, You drop. I don't know if I dropped out or you dropped out, but one of us it did. Just, it's, but I'll, okay. I'll edit that out. Hang on. Yeah, we're still we're still recording, so we're good. Um. So yeah, I was like, you yeah. know, Zach, and and he looks at me and he just kind of looks at me wide eyed, like I can't believe it type of look. And I'm like, well, what did it come up to? Because he's running right. the calculator, and so he takes it and shows me, and I'm like. And I'm like, wow, okay, let's measure it again. Let's make sure we didn't mess up because my, my daughter killed a 180 inch, uh, deer. Um, it was her third buck she ever killed and she was nine. <laughs> so she killed her first buck when she was, she killed her first buck when she was six and seven or six, no, seven, eight, and then nine. So, and she killed it at 40 yards. It was not a, her first one was like an 80 yard shot with a 20 gauge. And she just straight up, like she made a best, she made one of the best shots I've ever seen. Like I was, I remember cause it was, it was across and Ian's filming out the side of the blind and she's shooting like across the blind and we're pulling back the side of the blind. So Ian can film out of the blind and she, she shoots that deer and it was an 80 yard shot. And, um, 
you know, I was impressed. I was like, wow, for right. a seven year old making that kind of shot, right. good for you because, uh, I don't know that I would have made that good a shot. Um, and then anyway, so the, you know, she has a much easier shot on this deer when she's nine and, and it ends up being 180 inch deer bigger, bigger than any deer I've ever killed. So she likes to remind me oh, of that, that. She's killed a bigger deer than me. <laughs> and, but she, um, uh, I measured it and, I, um, the first time I measured it, it was like the night I got home and it was, well, it was the night I had, I had caped. So I, it was the, it was, let's see, we would have taken pictures that morning before she went to school. So she shot it, uh, in the evening. And then we went out that morning before school. She took pictures. I took her into school and then, um, I, I, uh, caped it out, cut it up, processed it and, and took the, took the deer head and everything. And I got it in the freezer. Cause I, I wasn't going to have time to run it to the tax room. It's just that right that minute. So then it ended up being late that night. It was like, um, midnight. I remember. And I measured that deer and I don't know what I did, but I did something wrong. And it was like in the one nineties and I'm like, it's not right. that big. I know that I screwed up something. So then I had my wife come out and help me so she could hold the tape or I could hold the tape and, and that kind of stuff. And I, I re I remeasured everything <clears throat> and I had her write down everything and, and added it back, back up. And then it was, um, right there at that 180 mark. I don't remember. It was like, I think it was actually what 179 and three or four, eight or yeah, three eights, I think, or something like that. Somewhere, somewhere just, just shy okay. of 180. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it was, um, one of those things where it's like, that's why I told Zach, I was like, well, let's, let's do our due diligence here. Let's remeasure it one more time. If we get, you know, if we're close, then we'll, we'll, we're good. Because I mean, obviously it's a green right. score and, and, and I don't, you know, I don't know that Zach will ever have it officially measured. I don't know that he cares necessarily what it, what it officially scores. Um, but, uh, you know, teach their own, I guess, when it comes to that kind of thing. But yeah, it was, it's fun chasing those kind of deer. We've had one deer, me and Dennis have chased that was in that threshold above 190. <clears throat> he disappeared on us last year. We have his sheds from the year before. And then last year we saw one trail cam photo of him and then that was it. Um, and it wasn't, it was actually from the neighbor. The neighbor sent us it and said, Hey, uh, we got this. We think this is him. What do you think? And it's like, yeah, it looks like him. Um, and then we just never saw him. Um, but we're hopeful that he might show up this year. Um, we did, we had a really cool encounter with him. He was close, uh, 40 yards. Ian was filming Dennis and, um, so, but we got both those sheds and, and that deer, um, he was in the mid one nineties. We, 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 we basically put a modest, um, we had, we had him officially scored at the deer classic, the sheds, and we put a modest like 15 inch spread or something like that, or even 14. I don't remember what Dennis used, but I know it was like mid one low, like 194 to 196, somewhere in that right. mid mid one nineties range. So, you know, you figure you get, if he doesn't, you know, even if he stays right. the same, he's still a, f a phenomenal sure. deer, but you hope that he puts on a little extra and, and breaks that 200 threshold. But I don't know, uh, maybe that chapter's closed and, and, and he died or, or somebody else killed him. We didn't hear about it, but it's like in that neck of the woods, we pretty much know our neighbors and we feel like we would know if he got shot. So, you know, it's, it's, we're hopeful he's alive and he didn't just right. die, you know, cause sometimes those old deer, like you, like you thought, you know, he was a, he was a huge deer. So, you know, and you guys have, you have more, you have to deal with more winter kill than we do up, up in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, even with your, <clears throat> we're more concerned with winter kill with turkeys and, and, and right. pheasants and quail and that kind of stuff more so than we are deer. I mean, uh, you know, we worry more about EHD probably, uh, in, in our neck of the woods, uh, than we do winter right. kill you know but, right yeah. yeah i mean you almost have to because it's god i mean that's when it comes through i mean it's devastating yeah 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 i know that the hd is is spotty this year the one thing that i've this is what i've maintained because we've been in long <laughs> because we've been in such long uh 
drought conditions and stuff like that. The drought has persisted for like not just a year, but literally we're on year four in some places in Iowa of, of pretty right. severe drought. Well, you need you need mud flats. You need a mud flat in order for that midge fly to hatch and, and to affect the deer. And so um, I don't think until we get a really wet spring and really a rebound of our river systems, because our river systems have been low really for so long, that if we don't get a rebound where we put water over those mud flats and then you get an opportunity for silt and stuff to right. build up and then actually get saturation of the soil because everything runs off so fast um, could, because we don't have any, you know, we have, we're very low on subsoil moisture. I mean, I, I, I have this theory that we won't see a massive widespread breakout. We'll still see it. It'll be spotty in places because there's going to be mud flats. I mean, we got, we've got, um, you know, farm ponds in Southern Iowa that are dry, that are drying up, that have mud flats that have never been dry before because it's so dry. So obviously there's the possibility there too, but you know, and a lot of my farms, I, I'm like, like we don't have any mud flats. Like our creeks and streams are completely dry in some of those places and they've been dry all summer. So there's no way you can have a mud flat to have that midge fly even hatch if you don't get right. any rain. Um, so I don't think we're going to see it at least locally for, for us, but there's, there's, it's spotty. I know they've been talking down there kind of, um, you know, in that Southwest Iowa area, there's some places that they've been talking about it. Uh, the biggest spot I've seen on the DNR, you know, tracking website has been, um, Southeast Iowa though. Like they got a bunch of rain late summer. Um, like the, the faucet just turned on right. for them, which was great for their for food sure. plots. <laughs> right. And, and, and realistically, um, once they got that it, rain, they, they probably thought that they were safe. You know, that that's the worst part. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, what happens is you get that rain and you get a bump in moisture. But then if you don't have sustained rain to keep that water over the top of that mud flat and then it recedes and you get a mud flat again, then boom, the midge fly starts hatching and then you're right. And then it's right. worse. It's like, you wish you wouldn't even had the rain because if it just would have stayed dry, you don't have right. a mud flat. So I heard about, uh, I don't know a, a few different guys, you know, talking about it, but I heard about one today that they, they lost 190 inch or not, not super far from, from where I hunt. Um, yeah, probably like 30, 30 minutes. Yeah. My guys that are down that way, They've been a little worried about it. They're they're a little more anxious than I am. And I'm like, yeah, it'll be okay, guys. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, it says, says you up there where you guys have been, you know. Right. Uh, and I'm like, I'm like, well, I'm like, it is what it is. There's nothing no. you can really do about it, honestly. That's that, unfortunately, like, as much as we'd like to be able to have control over that, that's that one thing that, you know, EHD scares me more than oh, 100 percent. It's not even close. It's not even yeah. close. Yeah. Like yeah, like CWD, like it, I, I do not fear that. Like 20 years ago when I was coming out of college and that kind of stuff, I remember it was the scourge of, it was going to ruin deer hunting as we knew it. And, uh, right. CWD that is, and it's like, none of those doomsday scenarios ever came to fruition. Like, yes. We found it in wild herds in Iowa, in in spotty and in places and that kind of stuff. But it really hasn't done anything to the right. deer herd there, um, and, and not in any meaningful way. Now we've had some. Uh, oh, 2012 was bad, uh, or maybe 13 actually uh, might be the one I'm thinking of was a bad year, and then I think 2018 and 19 for us was bad in our neck of the woods down here um, for EHD. And, and so we had a situation where, um, it was July and August, typical spring. We had good, uh, water levels and that kind of stuff, beautiful spring, lots of rain, all that kind of stuff that you want to see for the crops and everything like that. And then it shut off, uh, about mid July and we got our mud flats and EHG just broke out in central south central iowa just big and bad and it was like literally like you could drive down the road on gravel roads that had timber near water and you could smell right. death like you just smelled dead deer um 
and and that's the worst I've ever seen it was probably I think it was 18 or 19. I don't remember which maybe. Yeah, somewhere in that range um, was the last time that we had it really bad. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, it takes you a couple of years. You lose you lose some deer, but it is spotty. Like even like um, where some of our main farms were, we didn't find one EHD death, you know, but then you went 10 miles, you know, to another farm and you found 20 right. deer dead, you know. Um, so, you know, that you know, EHD, although you can't do anything about it, um, uh, it, it worries me more as a threat to losing a mature buck, like that 190 you talk about that, that they lost down there. It's like, you know, it's sickening, but grand scheme of things, there's nothing we can really do about it. I mean, there's just, it just is what it is. And you just got to hope that the conditions approve and we get into maybe a wetter period where we don't have to deal with, you know, or we get little seasonal mud flats where, yeah, you might get a little mud flat that shows up in August, but then it disappears once you get those rains in September and you're good to go. So it's limited. It's those long spans where you have mud flats that are exposed for long periods of time, six weeks at a time. And it only takes, I think, what is it? 48 to 72 hours to kill a deer once they've been infected. So, I mean, they're, they get bit and they're dead. And then a lot of people like, I mean, cause even Dennis and I were talking about it. Dennis asked me, he's like, so how's that even work? And I said, well, I was like, when they get infected, it's like, I'm like, it's a hemorrhagic fever. So they essentially, uh, it, their, their, their blood vessels and, and their organs basically shut down and break down and they basically bleed, had in, in uh, massive internal hemorrhaging and bleeding and they just bleed to death. Um, but they have a high temperature associated with it. And I was like, the only thing I can really compare it to is, you know, like with what, you know, you might see in humans would be like Ebola. Like, I mean, when you read about like what Ebola does to a human body and and that kind of stuff, it's a hemorrhagic fever as well. Um, They're probably vastly different, uh, you know, as far as like technically, like some scientist would tell me like, what are you talking about? (laughs) But, um, you know, that's that, you know, to describe on what it would do to the inside of a deer's body and how they die. The nice thing about it is it's pretty quick. I mean, they they don't, you know, they, they just get sick, get a fever and they're dead, you know. 48 hours right. later, and that's so. i mean that's why they're they're in those but, ponds is 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 they're just trying to cool themselves down yeah you know a, a lot of people think that it's yeah they're they're just super thirsty but it, it's they're just trying to get that dead body yeah. temperature down yeah yeah, it's yeah. A, that's a yeah. sad yeah. Do sad deal we've got cwd um around where where i hunt in minnesota and uh there's not it's not even close i i I don't worry about the cwd um the the only part that i i that i don't like about it is so minnesota's different than than a lot of the states in the midwest some of the biggest bucks have ever been been you know in minnesota but the way that Mm -hmm. people hunt here is is different than Iowa, Wisconsin, Kansas, Illinois. Uh, the, the the number of people that say, "If I don't shoot it, my my neighbor's going to," you know, or there's party mm-hmm. hunting during gun season, and and here's a guy that that cries he's never killed a big buck, and he's taking a picture with three little baby bucks that he that he killed, and it's like you're not going to kill a big deer if you you know shoot a doe. You know, if you have to kill a buck, kill one. But do you, do you have to shoot three or or four? Um, but in that southeast Minnesota where, where I I hunt, and I've had that lease for it's God, it's over thirty years. Um, there was a four mm-hmm. point on one side. You know, we we the people down there that hunted kind of fought for it, and and we seen big deer down there. Yeah, and I mean, completely different than the rest of the state. Um, and then CWD came in, and then they just they just shut it down. They, you know, kill as many as you want. You know, multiple tags. You can come in and buy a yeah. tag for two dollars, and it's um, it, it, it's crazy. So, so are they still, still doing? They're that? still doing it. Yeah, Crap. they're still doing it. So before this happened, um, you know, I had that that 
you know, split brow that was, you know, around 210. There was a four year period where I had three different bucks on camera um, that were right at that 200 inches and, and bigger. Um, you know, one just, it was one video. He was chasing a doe. I, I seen it one time. Um, just a giant. I mean, definitely, you know, he, he was right there, if not, you know, a tad bigger. And then there was another one that, that he was on the edge of one of the farms and then a, a neighbor shot it. And that, I think he went 202. Um, wow. But we always had really, I mean, it, it was nothing to, you know, there was at least one that was boon, you know, every year on camera at, at some point, um, you know, and now this year I've got, the two biggest ones that I have on camera, they're, they're both, they're super, you know, I mean, once I think he's eight years old, but they're low sixties to mid, mid sixties. Um, they're just too many people have been killing deer yep. a- around us. Um, and there's still a couple people that are, are holding out, but you just, it doesn't take a lot. You have one or two groups around you that just start hammering stuff. It's, it, it, it mm-hmm. just isn't the same. Yeah, for sure. And and <clears throat> one thing that I kind of think is interesting. So Wisconsin, um, and I don't know if they've changed their ways at all, but so 20 years ago when Wisconsin had that outbreak, they went with that whole eradication. Uh, that was their method was like, we're just going to decimate that deer herd in that localized area to basically try to lower the transmission of the disease because we, if we get it low enough, it won't, it'll eventually, um, you know, uh, it'll eventually die out. Like we won't have any deer that are infected with it, which doesn't really work with the way that prozone or whatever it is, or prion. That prion, the way it right. works. Yeah. That prion that sits in the, in the soil, in the soil right. it basically can sit there forever, forever. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so it doesn't really work to, to, to do that. Um, uh, but I mean, there is some sense of, you know, wanting to manage the herd to keep it in a reasonable, you know, carrying capacity. But I've talked about this before, like the, the habitats carrying capacity that we have, like, so obviously any, no matter what you're talking about, um, it, it, w- no matter what kind of animal it is, whether you're talking about grazing cattle, um, or whether you're talking about, you know, wildlife. Uh, in any in, in particular species will a particular piece of ground will sustain a certain carrying capacity and nature will basically take care right. of itself. Like, you know, whether it's through disease or through, you know, um, predators or that kind of thing, essentially it will take care of itself. But in the, in most cases, because of the, the, the areas we live in, and the amount of roads that we have and the amount of interaction that we have with deer and people, we never will get to that threshold because the human threshold that our tolerance level is much lower than what the habitat can right. handle. So we already keep those populations artificially low, whether it's farmers who want to keep deer from eating their crops or whether it's, um, you know, insurance companies that want to make sure that states are killing enough deer so that they don't have right. claims. Um, all those things factor into what we consider the human tolerance level or just, you know, people who have hit their fourth deer in four years that are tired of it, that that are just, you know, running their mouth in, in the public about, hey, I we need to kill right. more deer. All of those things are what, what we come in with that human tolerance level. And that will always be lower than the possible carrying capacity. So we'll never really get to that because we're always going to keep it in check with what, what we can deal with from a human's perspective. So to me, I always thought it was weird and I, and I was never gone the eradication route. Now we have high, we always had higher, we always have doe tags based on, um, you know, available doe tags is always based on population in a given County and we have um, 40 plus years of data to basically draw off of. And then obviously now we have 20 plus years of reporting data, uh, of harvest reporting data to, to, to also draw off of as well. Um, and so 
the DNR in Iowa has never gone the eradication route, except for with some very localized where they had an outbreak. Uh, I think that involved a deer farm contamination contamination from a deer farm, not right. wild, uh, not wild moving within the wild, but they went in and did some very, very localized type stuff where they was like, Hey, we really need to get, you know, so they did that through depredation tags, um, and through their depredation program, not necessarily through, a uh, that that was the widespread eradication of the deer population in that area. So I've always, I've always thought that that was probably the right thing to do. And then it's, that's why I asked is Minnesota and Wisconsin still going that route where they have these specialized quote unquote CWD zones where they have special rules they, within those areas. And I, I, I guess Minnesota I never really does. Kept track um, of it. Wisconsin, okay. they, they, I don't think they've done that for quite a while, but, but yeah, I, I've had buddies yep. that were in those areas and I mean, they just tried to wipe out the hurts. It, it just doesn't, what they yep. try to do doesn't make sense. The, to me as Iowa does things a lot better than, than they do here in, in, in Minnesota. Um, to me, it's realistically, I don't trust a lot of things that they do a lot, a lot of stuff that they say, they just come off as, as hypocritical. Um, we went down last year after everything was over to, um, pull a blind and uh, check a few cameras. And and one of the guys that's been on the lease with me, he calls me and he's like, he's sending me pictures and there's like a, a sled that you would use for ice fishing, right? That's sitting mm -hmm. by, in, you know, by one of our cameras. Um, and the camera's turned. They, they didn't want it taking pictures. And it's filled with corn. And I'm like, well, that doesn't even make any any sense, um, because I, I mean, hunting season's. Oh, I mean, we're not putting any, you know, corn in sleds or, or or anything like that. And he's like, "There's a blind up here," and I'm like, "What in the hell?" So I called the farmer, and here that the the DNR got permission from him to go in and, uh, and shoot deer after the season. So they're sitting there telling us that we can't put out any mineral or we can't put out any, any, any type of bait in the area at any point in there. Um, because they're, they're saying that it, it could spread, you know, because they're eating from the same area and here they're coming in with a trough. Basically that sled is a trough <laughs> of corn that they're leaving out. And, and they're trying to get rid of it, but right. but now it's okay for them while they're shooting these deer at night to to ha you know to eat right out of that that sled. Um, I don't know that that just irritates me. You know that that do what I say, not not what I do type mentality. Um, it, it's so that that has been debated for years in Iowa on whether or not Iowa should outlaw the use of bait, uh, and, and mineral sites outside of, you know, even outside the hunting season. And, and the, the reasoning was, is that there was a fraction of people that felt that, um, it would lead to the spread of CWD. And like, I was hearing this like, you know, 15 years ago you know, that people were really worked up about it. Like there's absolutely, I mean, there are mineral sites everywhere in Iowa. You could go to every farm and find, you know, I, I, I you'd be hard pressed to go to a farm in Iowa that deer hunting happens on and not find, you know, a mineral site right. somewhere. And so it's super prevalent, right? Cause I mean, there's, you know, it's just, it's widely used. Um, and for a good reason, like, I mean, there's a reason why we use it. It's not just to put deer in front of cameras. Um, but in saying that there is absolutely no evidence that shows that that is transmitted right. that way. So to your point, it doesn't make sense to have them outlaw that, even if it's only in a certain area of the state or the whole state for that matter, it doesn't make sense to outlaw that from that standpoint when they don't, I mean, 
show me a scientific study that says that we're spreading CWD via right. that and make that correlation. I mean, to me, from what I can tell is we, because we're sampling the crap out of deer for CWD here in Iowa. Like we have been for 20 plus years. Um, I, 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 back when I first got out of college, I worked for the DNR um, as a temporary, uh, well, essentially I was a um, AmeriCorps employee, but I spent two deer seasons running around to deer camps asking to sample brain stems for CWD. And we, you know, cut the head off, took the Y, the brain stem out where it was and sent in, you know, we sent it, we had a control, uh, and then we sent in the one to the USDA lab in Ames to have it tested. And so it was tested. And if we had CWD, then we sent in the control to double test the control. Uh, and, and, and if the control came back positive, then we had a, a double positive test. Um, and, and that right. was 20 years ago. Um, and so there's no, of the very, very few positive tests that have come back out of the thousands upon thousands that have been tested over the last 20 years, there's no way that you can say that it's being actively spread at all through any method, whether it's just deer to deer contact right. naturally versus that somehow mineral or feed would enhance that in any, any measurable way. So to me, I, you know, I, I don't put too much sense in that because if there was, if that was really, if that really did happen, we'd have way more positive tests and they would, they would, it would be, it would be spreading right. out. You know, you'd see movement right. of the disease and you just right. don't see it. it. It seems very localized where you have it. Yes. You will have occasionally a deer that will test positive for it, but it isn't widespread right. at all. So, and, and that's, you know, it, it's interesting. We went down that little <laughs> rabbit trail, um, you know, but, but, uh, but it is very, it is very something that is that, you know, that people have, very strong opinions of, um, you know, what about CWD? And sometimes people mix up CWD with EHD. They don't understand right. the difference between the two. To, and they you know, couldn't and, be, and they are very right. too. They very couldn't be different. any more different. They're, they're completely yeah. different to, to exactly. me. Yep. The, the, the whole CWD, the, the, the mentality of, of, of the people that are fighting for it and against it. Um, and, and the numbers of, of, affected by it right you know it's a small percentage right. of, of of deer that are actually going to die um it, it's mm -hmm. it's kind of a lot like coronavirus you know i mean you had people on both sides that that fought strongly you know on it um you know with right. with same right. thing with with percentage of that that were really going to completely get affected by it not not nothing like if all of a sudden if ehd came through and 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 you know just wipes something out so yeah they right, they just to right. me they couldn't be any and more that's, different yeah and, and and you're exactly right i mean that's the thing they are completely different one is a um uh, like one is more of an outbreak and it happens. It's very short. It's very effective and it can kill a lot of deer very quickly. CWD is nothing like that at all. CWD will affect a deer. Po it could be in a population and those deer could literally live with the HD in our, excuse me, could literally live with CWD for years and years and years. And then, you know, in some cases, you know, because we deer in the wild, don't really live astronomically right. long. Like we know what it takes to try to get, you know, we know what it takes to try to get a buck to five right. and a half, it's, you know, it's, it takes everything going in that in favor right. of everything. Deer. I mean, everything <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. You know, you, you start hunting a deer that's eight or nine. It's almost unheard of. It's, it's very few. That percentage yep. is, is that's a tiny number. That's a tiny number. Right. And that's the thing. Most deer, even if they do have CWD, they most likely get killed before it would ever even impact them. Um, you know, just because we do harvest a lot of deer in the right. Midwest. Um, you know, I mean, uh, and, and that's by design. Um, but yeah. Um, well, hey, Tom, it has uh, been great catching up with you. Um, we will definitely have to get, 
we're going to need to get a rut report at some point in time. So uh, we'll have to find a time where uh, neither one of us is in the tree stand. Um, but uh, we'll try to catch up here uh, maybe uh, in three weeks or so. Um, try to try to see if I can't get you Sounds back on good. and uh, check in, kind of see how your season's going, see what you're seeing for movement and that kind of stuff. And we'll just, we'll, I'm sure like, like I told you before we set this up, like uh, you and I don't have any trouble right. talking about stuff, especially when it's concerning right. deer hunting. So we will find a topic uh, to, to discuss uh, that's, that's probably um, relative relevant to uh, November uh, in hunting right. a rut. So um, appreciate your time, uh, tonight. Thanks Curtis for having and, me on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and like I said, we'll, we'll do it again, but, uh, thanks everybody for listening, uh, to another episode of the podcast here at Victory Outdoors. 